The last thing to look at in nutrition is something else that I feel has been talked about for such a long time. And it seems, you know, it always comes back around. You've written about this, you know, back in the early stages of the blog, even before there was a podcast. And I feel every now and then there's a new documentary that comes out or a new piece of content and it raises the question again, which is, does red meat give you cancer? And so if you had to look at that statement, let's say just red meat gives you cancer, where would you rank that in our ranking system today? So this is going to sound bold, but I would actually put this in the nonsense category, um, which is not to say that a dietary pattern high in red meat could not play a role in the development of cancer. But that's very different than the question. So if the question is, does red meat cause cancer? I think that is not correct. And I think there's plenty of evidence that that is not correct. If the question is, do people who eat a lot of red meat or do people who eat a lot of processed red meat have a higher risk of getting cancer? I think the answer to that question is yes, but it's probably less because of the meat, although in the case of certain processing, it may be the case, but it's probably much more because of what they're not eating. It's probably much more because their diets are, tend to be much lower in vegetables and specifically much lower in insoluble fiber, which plays a very important role in the prevention of colorectal cancer. So, um, th you know, the, the debate on red meat and cancer goes back for, for long periods of time. Um, and again, it suffers from all of the usual trappings of nutritional epidemiology, which is why... John Ioannidis famously said that all nutritional epidemiology belongs in the wastebasket. Um, the two most obvious problems with nutritional epidemiology in this regard are that it's very difficult to get an accurate reflection of what people consume using food frequency questionnaires. Uh, it's almost impossible. And secondly, uh, and I think more seriously, it's very difficult to disentangle the variable of interest from the other lifestyle variables that are covariates within the problem and that speak to what we refer to as the healthy user bias. So I don't dispute for one moment that every time you do an epidemiologic survey and you compare people who live on hot dogs and pepperoni to vegetarians, the epidemiology will always tell you that the vegetarians are going to live longer. Um, and while that might be an extreme example, you do appreciate that on average, those vegetarians have a much higher socioeconomic status. They are much more health conscious. They are exercising much more. They are much less likely to be smoking, doing yoga, all these other things. And therefore, how can we disentangle the variable from the effect? So um, when, you, when you look at the most compelling case for people who eat the highest amount of you know meat, and their risk of cancer. Um, you know, there was a there was a study that was done in Europe that looked at nearly half a million people, and it divided them into uh, a cohort that were eating more than 160 grams per day of uh, of protein from red meat and processed meat, and it compared them to people that were eating virtually none, 20 grams per day. So again, I like when they do this because you're at least taking like the most extremes. Um, and indeed, there was a difference, but it was relatively small, right? So even under that setting, um, it was the difference between a 1.7 uh, increase in the uh, increase in the risk of cancer uh, versus a 1.3 uh, uh, percent risk, absolute risk for um, colorectal cancer over the period of study. So just again, what does that mean? It means that the difference in risk between the super high protein consuming meat group and the low group was 0.4% uh, of actual percentage points. Um, so that means, you know, basically you have to put, you know, 250 people on a low meat diet to reduce one case of colorectal cancer. Um, and again, that's assuming that you arrived at this through randomization, which you didn't. Um, 
So again, there was another study that was done. Uh, it was a 10 year observational study that looked at about 150,000 people uh, with the highest tertile uh, of red meat consumption. And, you know, they had a 50% increase in absolute risk, uh, pardon me, in relative risk uh, to those uh, in the lowest tertile. Again, I could, you know, the, the error bar on this study was so big that it barely made statistical significance despite the sample size there, which I think, again, just speaks to the heterogeneity of this. Um, net, net, I would say that every one of these studies basically ends up having the same issue with it, which is when you look at the details, you realize it is very difficult to, um, to come up with a meaningful uh, view that it's red meat specifically that is driving cancer, as opposed to the absence of vegetables, the absence of fiber, or maybe the presence of some of the ultra processing things that go into consuming certain patterns of meat, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, gas station bought jerky and stuff like that. So, um, you know, we could talk a lot more about this, but I, I really think that the health effects, the ill health effects for red meat consumption is incredibly weak. Um, the hazard ratios themselves for this are very, very small, even with all of the limitations that I've mentioned. Um, and so therefore, if you go back to kind of the Austin Bradford Hill criteria of epidemiology, which, um, you know, I outline in great detail in the book, uh, very hard to imagine that there is causality here. In fact, the epidemiology here is so underwhelming that it almost draws the opposite conclusion that there, it's almost hard to believe there is a signal given how underwhelming the epidemiology is. Whereas conversely, when you look at the epidemiology of smoking or the epidemiology of exercise like th those are so overwhelming that it 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 factors into what we see as the overall causality narrative uh -huh.